It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. What's up? What's happening? Welcome in to the Take Command podcast. Craig Hoffman, Logan Paulson, and joining us off the top today, a man who many of you know, you just don't know that you know him. Uh, You saw the Instagram posts and such of the commanders working with the logs and doing the team building stuff. Well, one of the men behind that is Bill Hart of APG. And Bill is with us to talk about how he got connected with Dan Quinn, what they do at APG, team building, all kinds of fun stuff. So, Bill, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, It is our pleasure. And so let's just start with like your background, who you are, how you got into what you do now and and what APG is, this, this business that you've started that works with teams all over the country. Sure, man. Um, So yeah, I'm Bill Hart. I'm uh, with APG. I'm one of the founding members. And we've been doing this, man, I want to say about 12 years now. And uh, I spent my entire career in the SEAL teams. I came into the Navy in 1992, went straight into training and uh, spent about 10 years just, I mean, you know, from the player's perspective, just going to practice and never getting to play, which was kind of a drag. But um, yeah, towards the uh, towards the end of my career, I had been working on a psychology degree and I got into that because I spent a lot of time downrange overseas and I was the guy that would get stuck talking to people on target. You know, like you go looking for Carlos the Jackal or whatever and now here's a whole stack of people and somebody's got to talk to them. And they said, hey, that somebody's going to be you. And I was like, well, I don't want any part of that. And um, I ended up doing it anyway and got into the psychology end of things and uh, – Got uh, linked up with Mark Walker, my business partner now, and we stood up APG. And the idea here was really just to transfer what we know as special operations guys. You know, some of the little things that that I guess, you know, you take for granted after doing that job for a little while. And probably some of the things that, you know, older players can relate to this, like things you just take for granted. They're like, yeah, I know to do this, but now you got a guy coming in doesn't have any idea. And he's got to be shown like he's got to either be shown or he's got to sink or swim. And, you know, the idea here, I guess, is try to reduce the number of people drowning in that swing, sink or swim process. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, we uh, we started out, man, we started out like it was just it was just a good idea, you know, and uh, we had started out where our last job in the Navy was in this office called recruiting directorate. And um, what, what, what the job was essentially was you're a commercial for the SEAL teams. Like they, they'd send you to high school, send you to colleges, and you talk to the athletes and like, hey, here's the teams, you know, if you're into it. And um, what we ended up having was more and more coaches would want to bring their teams by the training center. And like, hey, could you do that little, you know, one hour talk or a little workout or whatever that thing you guys do? Could you do that? And that was kind of what gave my my business partner, Mark, gave him the idea for our business. But when we started out, it was like you'd call somebody and they're like, well, who have you worked with? And you're like, oh, well, I mean, you know, some colleges <laughs> and stuff, but I didn't, you know, I don't know. You know, so we started really small. And our first gig was actually our first gig as APG was actually a free gig we put on for a high school just in San Diego. And uh, they were like, yeah, that was great. You should charge for this. We're like, yeah, I know. Thank you. (laughs) 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 But um, yeah, I kind of fast forward a couple of years. We got linked up with with a cycling team called Novo Nordisk. And I don't know if they're still out there. This was a good few years back. Um, I think they they had had some 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 financial issues. Um, But you guys uh, started charging so much. Yeah, right. How, how can you afford this? <laughs> you can't afford me. But, uh, <laughs> now we uh, we had linked up with these guys, and this was a this was a cycling team that was all type one diabetics. And there's guys from I think it was like 13 different countries. Wow. So you had um, I mean you had guys with language barriers. There was a kid from Kazakhstan. Uh, there was a there was a what there was a kid from France, there was a kid from Spain. And then and those were like the, the, the guys that should be like high level pros. And they were really bent out of shape, you know, because they're, they're type one diabetic and they're like, I'm not where I should be. You know, I don't belong with these people. They are like the riffraff. You know, I'm better than this, but, uh, you got all these personalities and, uh, we did, we did some decent work there. And, uh, the owner of that team was at the time friends with Thomas Dimitrov, the, uh, the GM mm. at Atlanta, mm. who's a big cyclist guy. And he introduced us to, to DQ and DQ was, 
the first time we met him, you know, obviously he doesn't know us. And he's like, all right, you come out here and you start busting up my players. We're going to bust you up. You know, we're like, yeah, I understand. Man. I mean, look at the size of them. But, um, yeah, we, we got out there, had a good showing in Atlanta, worked with him a few years there. And then he brought us with when he went to Dallas and we worked with his defense there. And now here we are out in Washington. So it's been a good, good times. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I, you know, I got to do it and I really enjoyed the the process of like, I, I kind of missed all the hard stuff, got to do more of the fun stuff. But in terms of team building and getting <laughs> to know your teammates, it was a it was a really good time. But you said something kind of when you were going through your spiel about things you take for granted, you know, like mm -hmm. um, from a leadership standpoint, what are some of those things? And then like, how do you how does the training kind of bring those things out, um, especially in an NFL setting? Yeah, I mean, Having worked in a lot of different uh, different sports, like we've worked in every major sport at this point, football, baseball, basketball, hockey, and we finally got a, a pro soccer gig where we did an event with uh, the LA Galaxy. But you see some of these same things, you know, again and again and again across the professional athletic scene. And the first thing that struck me was that, like, these are young dudes. These are really young guys. Like, you look at guys on TV. And, like, when I was growing up, like, these are – men with serious mustaches who carry a lunchbox, you know, like these are serious people. These are grown men. Fact. And you get out there, they're not, these are young guys. These are very young guys. And not only are they young guys, they're young guys that have grown up doing this one thing, this one way, very, very particularly. So now you're thrown in with all of the other big fish from the pond and you're trying to find your way. And how do I set myself apart? And how do I, you know, rise above and, all they've had to go on for so long is, you know, what maybe what they hear from an older guy that's willing to give them some insight or maybe what they see on TV. And what do you see on TV is like, well, I got to drive a flashy car. Mm -hmm. I got to I got to act like a jerk when I come through the door. I need to have a hot girlfriend. These are the things that will set me apart. And like nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, so it's helping guys identify, like, what do these coaches want to see from you? What says to a coach? I am a guy that needs to be here. I'm a guy uh, without whom this this organization cannot cannot survive. We got to have that guy. How do you make yourself that guy? And it's not the car. It's not the hot girlfriend. It's the little those little little things. But those little things all stack up. All of them stack up. Show up on time. Help out the guy next to you. Make the extra effort. Go to the coach and ask questions. Hey, coach, how could I do this better? Am I doing this right? Am I understanding what you're wanting me to do? I think a lot of guys show up and they think like, I need to show up already knowing everything. I got to show up and I got to not ask questions. I got to let them know I know what I'm doing. Mm. Like, no, man, they don't want that. They want you to come and say, hey, am I doing this right? Because you go out there and do it wrong. They're like this guy, he doesn't know what he's doing and he doesn't want to ask. So I don't have time for it. I'm going to focus on this guy. Do you, do you see a big difference between – like the seals and the nfl teams because that was one thing i always kind of like even going through the training like i like i said i really enjoyed it but i was like d d does it apply in both spaces or do you have to modify it to kind of fit the nfl environment because the nfl environment is so transient and i feel like the seal team like you're on a team for a long time you get to know the guys really well you get to build that camaraderie and i feel like one of the reasons dq and the falcons and you know the the cowboys and now the commanders have brought you in is to kind of help accelerate that process mm -hmm. do you see differences and like what are some things that you do to handle the different populations there's some uh i mean there's a lot of similarities but there's also a lot of differences like there's um i guess the thing well, i don't know one of the things that we always say straight away is that we're not trying to make guys into SEAL team guys. This mm. is not that. Like We're not turning you into war fighters. We're not putting it in a guy's head like, I'm ready to go to war. I'm ready to die for the guy to my left and right. That's not, that's not what we're doing here. Uh, one of the other differences is that, you know, if a guy in training, a guy goes away out of training, there's a guy right behind him. Like there's a guy waiting to take his spot. You know, there's a guy chomping at the bit, like, just give me a chance. I want to try this out. It, at a team, you know, at a football team, these are guys that have been carefully assessed and carefully hand-selected, mm. and the last thing you want to do is break one of these guys. And, you you know, we're there as, uh, how can you say, like an adjunct, like I'm there to help. I'm here to – I want every single guy to be stronger and more confident and more capable when I leave at – at uh, SEAL training, such is not the case. 
if if you slip and fail, they're gonna a lot of times they're gonna leave you. Like you figure it out. What'd you do wrong, guy? And if you can't figure it out, there's a guy waiting to take your spot. And if you break yourself in the process, uh, that's okay too. See you later. World needs uh, people to mop floors. So it's a <laughs> it's a very it's a very different approach. Um, so there is a little more, there's a little more step-by-step, step, I guess, you know, if we're with a, with a football team, we're going to talk through it a little bit more. And that was something that, um, that I kind of noticed early on in my career in the SEAL teams was there's a lot of things where you're like, you're just left to figure it out. Mm. And nobody's going to spell this out for you. And maybe, maybe somebody takes mercy on you and an old guy will come to you and like, Hey, stupid, look, do this. Don't do it. Quit doing it like that. And then you're like, Oh, okay. I understand. You know, you don't, don't, you're, you're a brand new guy, you know, like understand that you don't know anything, but they won't tell you you don't know anything. They'll just kind of laugh at you off to the side, like, you're stupid, this guy, (laughs) right? Uh, But now at a football team, what we try to do, especially when we get a chance to work with the rookies, I love being able to work with the rookies because it's like, it's not saying teams are doing things wrong. It's just that there's things that aren't being done. You're not taking a guy under your wing and like, look, kid, like you, there's a lot here to know. Like you know a lot about football, but there's so much you don't know. I mean, I've been, I mean, and I can't remember the first time we worked with Atlanta. I, I want to say it was like 2015 or something. And then we've gone through seasons sometimes with multiple teams, you know, through a season. So I've been through. I want to say like 12, 13 seasons at this point, following mm. a team through. And you see things that like, you know, you, you just want to speed up that process, mm. right? That, with, where a guy can come in, find his footing, figure out what he doesn't know. Who can tell me how the hell to do this? Get the guy going and get him down the road. I'm curious if you've noticed your work team to team, like comparing them across years and, and across even, you know, one year to the next for some of DQ's teams. Um, when you have a guy like a Matt Ryan, uh, who, who was with Logan in Atlanta, uh, a bo- guy like Bobby Wagner here, and you get into these sessions, do you see some of the leaders emerge? Do you occasionally get to a team and you're like, man, you don't have to name names here if you don't want to, but by all means, it would be great for the podcast if you did. Uh, you know, you get to a team and you're like, Oh, this team's in trouble. They don't have any leadership. Like we can do the best we can, but ultimately, like this team needs a dude, and they don't have a dude. Like, can, can you tell those types of things as you start to work with these teams? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, when uh, when you start to make guys uncomfortable, you know, then you'll see some guys. It's it's a very weird thing, you know, to be at that far end of the bell curve, working at that far end of the bell curve. It's a very strange thing. It's kind of like. Um, I guess some guys, it's kind of like the like the honed edge of a knife. Like it's very, very sharp, but it can also be very fragile, you know. So a guy is that good, you you know, he, if you shake him a little bit where it's like, hey, you're out of your element now. Now what do you do? They don't like that. They don't enjoy that. Other times there will be a guy that's like, yeah, this is all I needed was, you know, a chance to, to demonstrate that I can think under pressure. I can make decisions under pressure. And in that in – that, type situation you'll see guys that you would not have imagined step up and start like hey come on you and it'll be like some guy that maybe he's never been recognized as a heavy hitter um but he just he'll just emerge i remember when we were in um it was a trip though one of the things we had to deal with because when we were in atlanta and when logan was there and i remember you texted me man after that the exercise that we did i can't remember if were you there at uh were you there the year before no, I was there in 17. So I like I missed all like the hard stuff and I got yeah. to just do fun stuff with paintball guns and <laughs> night missions and stuff. So it was cool. Did you do the did you do the the hostage rescue one? Yes. Where we did um yeah, yeah, that one was that was really cool and uh Wait, who was the hostage? Just people in the building, like employees. Like oh. it was like, like they got like people like around the building to volunteer to be like you know, like combatants and all this kind of stuff. And so you'd show up, you're like, man, you're like the lunch lady. Like, why do you have a yeah. paintball gun? You know what I mean? Like, it just is like a random deal. But yeah. That's funny. I mean, well, yeah, I mean it'd be pretty hilarious if like Julio Jones was the hostage. The whole the <laughs> Petros running down yeah. from the front office. Well, it was cool because the first year, the, the first time we did a scenario thing with the team, we had uh, Scar was the hostage. And we did. Oh, that's right. The, uh, that's right. 
Were you there for that one? Or yeah, I was there for that one. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. that one's that. So that was kind of the one that everybody was looking forward to the next time, and it was like it was super fun, but there was lots of lessons involved, like how mm-hmm. you think under pressure, and, and a lot of this was for the coaches. And like like quick recap, the way we did it was we hooked up with the uh, Atlanta SWAT guys, and we had this at their facility, and we had the Atlanta SWAT guys being the the op for the opposing force. But I had to tell them, like, very specifically, like, stand in this place. And when they come <laughs> around that corner, you shoot at them. And when they shoot back, you fall down dead. Because the point of this, <laughs> like, the point of this is, is to teach guys, like, look, you got a plan. But now when it gets yeah. hectic or people start doing different things, you got to be able to think through this and talk through this. It's not paintball. I don't want you to just go paintballing. Mm-hmm. Right. Because the football players versus the SWAT team and paintball advantage SWAT team. Yeah, That's right. right. <laughs> Unless you set up the SWAT team to fail, uh, yeah. which was the point of the drill. That was actually success. Yeah. But what we saw was like uh, we had the, the the older players, we had the vets going last. So those guys launched out at like midnight. And the reason we had to do it like this was because like union rules, like you can only work guys for this amount of time. So we had mm. to be like, all right, you show up at this time. You're going to work for like an hour and then you go away. Get out of here. You're not on the clock. But so the first crew we had was actually the coaches and they went in broad daylight. And this was when the SWAT guys were still doing what I asked them to do. And like, they stand in a place and like, ding, 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 die American. And then they fall down. <laughs> and some of the coaches were like, one guy, I don't remember who it was, but one guy went to Platt and like, he's like, started wandering off into the bushes. I was like, Hey, where are you going? Oh, and that's right. Like, yeah. I remember that story. <laughs> yeah. And like, where are you going, man? And he's like, what? What? I'm like, get on the bus. Yeah. He goes and gets on the bus. But now the last crew, um, like the SWAT guys were just all over the place, but they had a really good plan. And uh, they got in there, they grabbed Scar, and that poor guy, like he got ragged all for like five runs in a row. Like these giant dudes, like, whoosh, like lifting him up and throwing him <laughs> into the back of the van. It's like, this sucks. I'm never doing this again. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the second one, this, the next year that Logan was talking about, uh, Matt Ryan got kind of bent out of shape yeah. because the way we did this was um, – we made this so that it was like you have to adjust on the fly. We focus more on adjusting on the fly. So, you know, like when you get a guy injured midseason or you come out here with an approach to this this team that's not working, you got to adjust. What are you going to do? So that was what we did with this. So we told them it was like going to be the same thing. You're going to go link up with this partisan faction, get handed your paintball guns. You're going to go you know, save the princess, slay the dragon or whatever. And we got out there and half of them got to go save the princess and the other half of them got rolled up and put in like a POW situation. Yeah. Dude, people (laughs) were hot. Craig, people were pissed. Like people were really (laughs) upset because last year was so fun. And then all of a sudden it was like you didn't get to do it and you got to like hang out in a bunker for an hour. Like it was like. (laughs) <laughs> I remember people being so upset about it. But anyway, go ahead. Sorry. He was, you no, know, and well, Logan texted me later and he's like, hey, man, two is hot over this thing. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, two, who the hell is two? And he's like, yeah. Matt Ryan, dude, he's mad yeah, about this. He on. wanted to he's do the mad thing. About this. Yeah. I'm like, dude, you know, you got, when you're at a level of a, you got infinite money, you can, dude, I'll set up a paintball thing for you. We'll do it on an <laughs> island somewhere. <laughs> we can go do that. You know, I'll get like a legit role players out here. We'll get Carlos. Yeah, that, was, that was not the point of the drill, Matt. Come on. Yeah. But, but I told yeah. him like, well, him and uh, who else, man? Um, yeah, a lot of people were upset about it. All the yeah. old guys were upset about it. Yeah. Because like they all wanted to go do the game. Yeah. And they didn't get to do it. And I was, but I talked to a couple of guys the next day and I was like, look, the fact that you're talking about this the next day tells me that the point was made. Like this was what you needed. Like you needed to be in a position where you're disappointed, you're pissed off. You got to think on the fly. And now you got the girl from the lunchroom is slapping you, telling yeah. you, answer the <laughs> That's <question>. right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, I, you know, the other thing I'd say about it though, it's like, cause it seemed so, I don't know. It just seemed like fun, but I will say like, it was one of the best team building things that I did in my 10 years in the NFL. Cause it like forced you to be with a bunch of guys that you didn't know that well. Right. So I remember my first year we, we did the, the scar rescue with the SWAT team. Like Matt Ryan took us all out to dinner and like I was on his like boat crew. And so we all got to hang out with Matt. We got to make a plan. We got to communicate. And so like just kind of building that cohesiveness, and then the second year, I remember I was like the leader of the boat crew. Oh, yeah. And it was a really, it was really good for me, honestly, to kind of, again, like learn how to communicate with different types of people. Cause you're with like, you know, the third string linebacker, you got the kicker on your team, you've got the 
a starting offensive lineman. So everyone's kind of got a different way of communicating. And then the other thing that I thought was really interesting was like you said, you try not to do this, but in that environment of like, you know, I'm like super type A, I want to control every facet. Um, and the feedback I got on the leadership side was like, you're being too controlling. You don't let people kind of go out and do their thing. And I thought, man, that's like, that's something that I've lived, like I've lived with as a, as a rule for the rest of my life, because it's like, I can't like micromanage you in every situation. Mm -hmm. I've got to give, I've got to empower you enough to kind of go make this decision. So not only did I get to learn my teammates and learn how to communicate with every facet of the roster, but I also got to learn kind of some stuff about myself in terms of managing those relationships and so i don't know it's it's it was one of those things where again like it's it's fun and you're with the guys you're hanging out but i remember thinking like this this is really really cool for all of these reasons right yeah i get to know my team especially with the free agency situation the way it's set up now it's like there's i remember from from what was it that off season in 16 to the off season in 17 the roster turnover was like 50 percent so you had to learn a bunch of new guys, you know what I'm saying? And I just think mm -hmm. it's 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 something that I think a lot of people maybe poo poo or they don't really see the value in. But I'd say both those two off seasons, I, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot, a lot about the team, and I do think it's like a strong kind of binding factor with those groups. Yeah, well, I mean, you guys are on a a much uh, a very compressed schedule compared to what we do, you know, in the SEAL teams. I mean, with us, it was like. These, a lot of these will be people you already know. And now you say you go to a different team, like I'm at team one and now I, you know what, I go be an instructor and I go to team five, I'll show up and there'll be guys that I know. I might be in mm -hmm. a platoon with a bunch of guys I know, but we've got a year and change of a workup where we're going to be together every single day for 12 hours a day. And then we're going to deploy. You guys yeah. got, you know, what, a couple of months. And yeah. in some cases it's some college kid and you don't know this guy's deal. Like he might be on some total other page and how do you, how do you deal with that? But I mean, I, what you're talking about, I think is that's like one of those, one of those early leadership lessons where you like, you, you know, how much is too controlling and mm -hmm. how much is, you know, I'm strangling your innovation or, you know, if I give you too much rope and now you screw this up, it's like finding that happy medium. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Cause like you talk about that, like, and people say, well, why does that matter? But it's also like in terms of how you interact with people. You mentioned the young guys coming in or the free agents coming in. Like, how do I, as a leader, and I might not have like, you know, the Matt Ryan level of leadership, but, you know, you're, you're, everyone's kind of a leader in their own way. Like, how do I communicate with this person and stuff like this? And like you talked about, you said like making guys uncomfortable to see how they react is another like tool, right? Like as if this guy's really upset or he can't handle adversity, like how do I motivate him? in these situations. And I think it's great for the whole roster over this three or four day period to kind of figure that out. And, uh, and I don't know, was that, was that a, was that a goal of you guys? Was that a goal when you kind of set out to start do this or was that just kind of a happy byproduct? Yeah. I mean, that was, that was something that kind of presented itself early on. And I think that is something that you see in the SEAL teams because you're, you're together so much, you know, you're not just together on, on, you know, your equivalent of a football field, you know, you're, out in the bush or whatever, you're you're together all the time. You're together at meals. You're together in the rental car. You're together all the time. So you get to see guys in a variety of situations. So you can kind of you, you tend to learn how guys think, how they communicate, how they interpret the world around them. For you guys, it can be. I, I think it's a little more restricted. Where maybe you see guys in the meal room, but then you see guys in the locker room and on the field. And between, mm -hmm. you know, between there, it's like, I don't know, do guys hang out or not? Sometimes, right. sometimes not. So that's, um, we see that with, with players. And we also see that with like a lot of our corporate clients is mm. taking them out of that boardroom setting, taking them out of that work environment. They get to appreciate each other for like, mm. oh, this guy is, he's really smart in this kind of way, or this guy is really thoughtful in that kind of that's way. So when you need an idea, you know, the person that that's pitched is like, this is the star, you know, because there's, I think leadership is its own, its own skill set. You know, so a guy could be a phenomenal linebacker, a phenomenal quarterback, whatever. That doesn't make him a great leader. That's its own skill set. And it's the same thing in the teams. Like you might be a great shooter, but he's not a very good leader. A guy could be a great leader. Like, well, he's a mediocre 60 gunner, whatever. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> but it's its very own skill set. Right. You know, and when a guy develops that, it, but uh, you develop that and then recognizing that, you know, from the higher ups, like, oh, this guy, this guy's got a good brain on him. Let's, mm-hmm. let's see what we can do with him. Right. So I want to get into some of the methodology and the psychology background of it all in a second, but just to follow up on what you just said, you think that leadership is a skill that can be taught versus something that is innate? Like there, there certainly, if you put a big group of people together and give them a mission and you don't give them any further instruction, someone's going to emerge as the leader. That's the natural way of things. And that person might be good or bad at it, but someone's going to step up. Uh, but you think the actual skill of leadership is something that you can teach? And and what does that then mean for like a sports team? Do you want to then embrace the person who maybe has some natural leadership inclinations? Or do you want to make sure that the quarterback and the middle linebacker, for instance, are taught that leadership and and that's actually the best thing for the team in the long run? Uh, I mean, there's that's, that's a lot to unpack there. Um, so just like just like any talent, just like quarterbacking, you know, you could teach a guy the mechanics. Like we could go out there and you could teach me the mechanics. It doesn't mean I'm ever going to be good at it. It's not sure. the cards, right? We talk about that on this podcast all the time with literally any football position in me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to do it. I can't yeah. do it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, so just like that, there's going to be people that are more naturally inclined and there's going to be people that – uh, you can only go so far with this. I think in terms of, you know, when you say leader, there's, I think there's a lot of different, I don't know, how can you say a lot of different flavors there? There mm, can be yeah. the guy calling the shots from atop the horse. There can be the guy that's standing right next to you. They're like, well, yeah, the boss is saying this, but I'm going to look at this guy because he's been here forever and if this guy gives it the green light, then I'm going to do whatever he does. Mm-hmm. So these are all versions of leadership. I mean, like perfect example was um, when we were in Iraq and the U.S. really went the extra mile to kind of push the people away from the the shake system, like the tribal system that they had had for centuries, for millennia. That's This is what these people know. And they really tried to bring in this, like what we're more familiar with, like, like uh, civic leadership, you know, like city councils and mayors and this kind of thing. And these people are like, okay, great. He's the mayor. So I would have to go to these meetings every week because I was like, you know, secret squirrel. I'm our man in the, you know, local city meeting type thing. So I got to go to this thing and I sit there and like the mayor shows up and everybody kind of does this thing. Like, yeah, he's the mayor. I got to be here. He speaks well and he's, funded by the Americans and that's terrific. And they'll do what he says, give or take. But now when this guy leaves, now the shake shows up just Mm. to see how things are going. And now when he shows up, everybody stands up and everybody's got hugs for him. And, oh, hey, man, when's your family coming back from Jordan and Mm. all this? And so one guy is a leader. One guy might know how to lead. This guy over here, he's he's also a leader. They're just – it's a very different flavor. I think there's a component of recognizing, like, who are the people in the room here? Who are you talking to? And I'd say a component of good leadership is recognizing when, if it ain't you, that's okay. Set Mm. the example by being a good follower. You don't have to be the guy from atop the horse saying, take that hill. You can just be the guy to the side saying, yeah, the guy's got a good point. Let's do what he's saying. Mm. And then you go ahead. That's a great Um, point. There is a... kind of a quadrant system um, of leadership that I actually learned from my wife. She did a lot of studying of history uh, and presidents is the the forum of which she learned this through. And, and we were talking about it because we're gigantic nerds and this is the kind of stuff that occasionally we talk about. But it's I'm curious if you've heard of this and, and how it kind of plays into what you guys do of active, passive, and then positive, negative. Mm. So the you can be active, uh, you know, active, positive, but you can also be active, negative. You can be passive, positive, or passive, negative. Basically meaning you can act and have a positive or negative effect or you can stand back and have a positive or negative effect. And, uh, you know, what she studied was where all the presidents uh, fit in that, those quadrants, which is a, a fun conversation for a very different podcast. Uh, but I'm curious when, when you talk about like being the guy who's just like, yeah, no, we should follow that person versus the person who's like, let's go. How does that active and passive role play, but also to make sure that everyone's moving in, a, in the right direction, the, the positive negative side of leadership? Yeah. Um, so when we talk to, uh, when we talk to coaches about basically shaping behavior, 
this is this is something that we 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 don't package it with those exact same terms, but in some cases, yeah. And this is um, what you're talking about. Sounds like a version of conditioning, where you're talking about positive and negative, what they call punishments. So there can be rewards and punishments, and you think of just a punishment as just a bad deal. Right? This is something I didn't want to happen. Right. So this is like with. Um, with your dog, you know, if you do this thing, I give you a treat. If you <laughs> do that thing over there, I smack you with a newspaper, you know, or I walk in and uh, I'm not happy to see you. But if the dog stops, you know, begging at the table, stop begging at the table, I'll stop making mean faces at you, you know? So in all these ways, it's again, positive, negative and reward versus punishment. Um, what I think a lot of, I mean, especially my generation, what we grew up with was really just punishment. Like go and do things. And when you do something wrong, you're just going to get smacked. That's what you're going to get. Uh, and and like with my generation and the teams, like the, the guys before me, that was like all you had to work with. Like, what should I do? Like, just go and do things. And when you get taped to something, you'll know you did the wrong thing. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's not effective, right? That's not what we want. So what we try to push for instead is instead of, you know, guys complaining, because a lot of times guys will just complain. That's the only tool they feel like they have in the bag is like, hey, this sucks. Hey, this is stupid. We should do something else. Okay, well, what else should we do then? Mm. Come with a good idea. Don't just come with a complaint. And when, you know, there can be, you know, it's not more than more than one way to skin the cat, right? And this is something we'd see with with young guys, we call the one platoon wonder. Like most dangerous man in the world is a guy with one platoon. Like he's got a thousand good ideas and you know, mm. none of them make sense. But he'll say, Well, this is how we did it last time. This is how we did it. This is how we man, you have one version of how this job goes. There's about a hundred different ways to do this. You've got one. The boss is saying do this, unless it's an absolute bear trap and a complete disaster. Just be a good example. Go do that thing. Mm, right. Yeah, yeah I'm curious, Logan, real quick to, to lean on your experience, uh, not necessarily just with APG, but as a player over your career, like the idea of that positive negative side, even more than the active passive. But did because I, I think I've covered guys here that led the locker room in a bad direction and it caused problems and it, they were leaders. They had people following them. Uh, which by definition makes you a leader, uh, but it wasn't in the direction that the coaches wanted to go. And it wasn't one that led to winning. And I'm curious, you know, if, if you've had experiences in the locker rooms you've been in of both like really great positive leaders that led a large groups of, of the team or the whole team in the right direction versus sometimes where maybe a locker room was splintered in part because there was a leader who was leading against the grain. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like that whole idea of, of like just buying in, that that uh, that Bill was talking about is something that like is interesting. I've never heard it said that way. Like the one platoon guy. Like there were guys who would come from different teams and be like, "This is <laughs> this is how we used to do it when I was with the Eagles or when I was with the Ravens." And you're like, the way we're doing it right now actually isn't that deleterious. It's fine. You know, like it's it might not be the perfect schedule. It might not be. It's different than what you want. But you being so obnoxious and annoying in the locker room is bringing the young guys to you in a way. And it's it's fracturing the locker room. And so I do think that that is like a really interesting component of just like the more experienced you are as a veteran in the locker room, the more you can just be like, hey, man, like this is the schedule. Like, let's give it a shot. You know, it might not be perfect, but let's do it. And I think we saw examples of that last year, just covering the team when he comes in and changes the schedule. I was gonna like, say, yeah. like a lot of people get really dogmatic. And this is I've had this experience too, really dogmatic about the schedule. But in reality, it's not that much of a deviation from what you were doing before. And so, I, you know, the one that I think of that was the most definitive example of poor leadership. But it was like the example of the newspaper thing that Bill was talking about, too, is I remember when Deshaun Jackson came into the team. He's And again, Deshaun is a really good football player. And I think he was a better teammate than a lot of people like want to give him credit for. But if you let if you gave him space to take advantage of a situation, he would. If you didn't, if you said, hey, this is not what we're doing, he wouldn't do it. He was like he, he played within the lines really well. But if the lines weren't very clear, he would just wander off, you know. So like I remember one day, like he showed up late for practice. And no one said anything to him. And so, like, for me, I was like, well, that's unacceptable. But it's his first year with a new team. And uh, and Gruden was the coach. And Gruden didn't say anything to him. So the next day, like, him and Trent come late to practice. It's like, okay, well, someone should say someone something to somebody. And then it goes on. And by the end of that week, there's 15 guys coming late to practice. Like, they're missing warm-up. And you're like, 
This could have been, and this is not anybody being bad. No one set a standard. No one took the newspaper and wrapped you on the nose or even just bought you aside and put your arm on you and said, hey, man, we don't come like to practice. Like, that's just not what we do here. That might have been acceptable at a previous location, but that's not acceptable here. And so, like, in, and this is, again, just showing the maturity of, of playing for 10 years and watching a lot of football. Like, in the time, I was mad at the player. I was mad at Deshaun. I was mad at Trent. I was uh, mad's the wrong word. I was frustrated that they weren't uh, adhering to a standard. But now, like with this this conversation, reflecting on it, like it's not their fault because no one said, "Hey, man, we don't do it this way." And like mm-hmm. that's a simple correction, a simple solution, and an example where it's not even leadership. It's just, I guess that's its its own type of leadership, but it led to a negative result because. The coach didn't set the standard. And then the players not knowing the standard just kind of did what they wanted, you know? And mm-hmm. I think that that is, it's, you see it all the time. And so like, I was actually going to ask this because I think it's somewhat re- like relevant because, you know, Bill, you've seen a lot of teams is for me, after thinking back in my career and some of the things you've talked about, it's, I think it's really interesting because how important is leadership actually from the players when it's the coaches that just set a parameter because most of the guys want to abide by the parameter, you know, abide by the rules, play within the lines. And so like, and because there's so much turnover on the roster, how much is it just, just that the coaches need to be like, hey man, this is the standard. And I think Dan Quinn does an excellent job of this. This is the standard, this is how we operate. And then everyone just kind of falls in line because they're all, they all want to be, they're all good guys for the most part. And the bad mm-hmm. guys, because you have so many good guys on the roster, We'll kind of fall in behind you. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so in terms of like who's driving this train, like why why are things happening the way they happen? Like I heard this, um, man, I can't remember how long ago it was now. I want to say like 30 plus years ago, I had heard, I heard a comedian actually talking about this. And the idea was that like, say you walk into a club, you walk into like nightclub and the DJ is spinning, the people are dancing but you know, you're there long enough, there's a kind of an ebb and a flow and a, mm. there's like a cycle to it. And it's high energy, it's mellow, it's picking up. It's, but who sets that tone? Is it the people out there shaking their ass or is it the guy in the DJ booth? If you ask mm. him up there, he's gonna say he's looking at the crowd. Mm. If you ask the people down there, they're gonna say they're listening to the music. So it's a very interactive thing. It's like, it takes both sides of this thing to make this thing work. So if you've got if you've got players and all they're gonna do, and this took this actually took me a really long time to get my head around because like in the teams they'd say, We want to see extra out of you, we want to see more, bring me more. And I'd say, Man, you got something you want, just ask me for it. I'll deliver right. it. But don't come to me with like, do more. Just ask me for what you want. But eventually I figured out that like what they're asking you for, what they're telling you do, do these things, don't do those things. That's the baseline for what they expect. That's the baseline for functioning here. When you as as either an operator or a team member or a player or a guy out there in the office, when you start doing more, that shows the leadership, that shows the the coaches or whoever's driving this train, that shows a little more, an extra tool that they have to work with now. That shows them the direction that this thing needs to go, just like the guy in the DJ booth. Which way is this thing going? All right, could be, because there's... I mean, how many how many teams do you got to look at where you see like some guy that was like he got brought in as a receiver and now he's a fantastic running back or he got brought in to do this thing, but he's also doing that or he got brought in here. And for some reason, him and these two other guys just formed this really sweet unit where they're just crushing in this, you know, this this situation. That stuff doesn't happen if the only thing you do is what the coach tells you. So it's this very give and take thing where you've got to be pushing a little bit, doing a little more, but you also got to be willing to say, hey, I'm going to do, I'm going to let this guy drive the train. If he Mm. says, don't do that, then I just won't do it. Yeah, no. And that's a really hard, that's a really hard balance, you know? And it's just like, God, it's, it's like such a frustrating conversation to have because there is, it's such a nebulous thing, you know? And, Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting that you guys, you kind of teach it. I don't want to say in a nebulous way, because that sounds like you're not being very specific, but there is a kind of like, this is leadership, but this is also leadership. And for me, who's very black and white, I was black and white as a player, that was always hard, but it was really good exercise because it reminds you that like, like you said, I could be the guy standing next to the guy, or I could be the guy, 
or I could be the third guy kind of herding little geese along and making sure everyone's abiding by the rules. Like, and on a team, it's funny because all those roles need to be established when like within like, you know, probably 60 or 70 days, you know what I mean? But it, they all kind of formulate. And I do think that the process that you guys push the team through kind of helps accelerate that a little bit, which is great. So. Yeah, I think it's also interesting because this is actually the continuum that I was talking about with the the active passive, yeah. negative mm-hmm. positive, right? Like negative passive or passive negative is nobody said anything to 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 Sean, right? Mm-hmm. Like that is a passive negative outcome. Um, but it's on that continuum because there's the guys who like do nothing, but there's the guys who like do a little bit, and and it's it's kind of that that flowing continuum because any team dynamic, no pun intended here, but any team dynamic is dynamic. It is constantly changing, especially in the NFL where literally guys are in and out of the building. Guys are up and down the depth chart. If you go from, if you're Marcus Mariota and you come in thinking I'm going to be the starting quarterback or maybe even a better example, like Jacoby Brissett last year, still found a way to be a huge positive influence on the Washington commanders and on Sam Howell, even though he didn't get the opportunity that he thought he was going to get to start. But he could have been a huge, huge negative in that locker room. And instead, he's just like, I'm a vet. I know what I'm here to do. And he found a way to be positive. So I, I think that um, that kind of understanding of of the dynamics of a room and the ability to either poison or positively impact, that is leadership in its own way. And everyone's got their roles to play, which I'm sure is part of what you guys try to teach Bill in the way that you do things. Like, you know, everyone saw the log picture, so we can kind of wrap up talking specifically about the commanders and and maybe even that drill, but like everyone's got to help pick up the log. Someone might have to be the leader to, to call out the signals of when to do it and all right, one, two, three, lift. But if someone doesn't carry their weight, then you're, you're going to have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, um, there's a lot to that because there can be, you know, there could be a guy that's, that's very vocal, but maybe he's stuck way down there on the end and, mm. You know, he's usually the leader, but he's kind of out of the picture now. And the guy over here, like, well, you're in a position where you're going to have to relay the calls. Well, who's the leader here? I mean, mm-hmm. the guy at the end that everybody usually looks at, he can still kind of, like, if everybody's still glancing at him, the best thing he can do is like, yeah, I wait for that guy to make the call. And then if we're doing squats, mm-hmm. then I squat. You do the same thing. And now you're just kind of, you're leading by example. You don't have to be speaking up. And that's, you know, that's that's a young guy thing, I think. We say, hey, we want to see some leadership. Just doing the right thing can be leadership. Mm. Like, oh, he's doing it. I guess I should do it too. Uh, guys will think that, like, I need to stand on a chair and point my finger. Come on, everybody. And, like, no. that's That might be you just walking everybody off a cliff. That doesn't help. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, it, was there anybody specifically that stood out in the drills? Like, when you were – you know, because you get to work with the, the whole team, which is a very mm-hmm. unique spot to be in. Like, I'm trying to think the only person who gets to do that is probably – the strength coach usually, but you get to see the whole team. Is there anybody that you're like, man, this guy has kind of interesting, an interesting leadership style or a very effective leadership style, or you see his experience talking with people. Any, anybody that stood out to you in that regard? Off the top of my head, not, not straight away, but when we're doing that, I mean, it's just like being a SEAL instructor, like you would, uh, sometimes you would meet guys that you put through training like years later and they'll, and they'll say, Hey man, do you remember me? And, and you're like, no, I don't. Remember <laughs> you, dude. And, um, and that's actually a good thing. Cause like, I would say the same thing and, and instructors that I would run into would say the same thing to me. They're like, no man, I'm not looking for, I'm not looking for, you know, who's standing out. I'm trying to keep you idiots alive. You know, mm, So right. you got that log and you're out there hustling. Like a lot of times uh, when we do the log, it, it we, we try to make it feel a little bit chaotic and a little bit hectic, yeah. but um, everything Which is, is actually very. It's a cool. It's a cool. It's a cool tactic. Yeah, because it, I was actually like, going to ask, yeah. like how intentional that is. It sounds very, but I, I read the book uh, Freakonomics, which is or think like a freak from the Freakonomics authors, and they talk oh. about in that one of the concepts that they teach is the one of the strongest bonds that will form are people that go through something really hard mm-hmm. together, and they talk about like people that are you know, in an airplane crash or, you know, stuck in a mine or whatever that have never met themselves 
or never met each other before, they go through this really intense, in some cases, traumatic event, and they're bonded for life instantaneously based off that one thing. And not that you're trying to uh, traumatically bond a team <laughs> over a log carry, but uh, how, like, is that part of the intentionality of making it hard, making it chaotic, that there is just some bond that forms when people go through something hard together, which then leads to, you know, Dan Quinn's favorite saying of like, I like doing hard uh parentheses Stuff. things yeah. uh with with good people yeah yeah there's definitely something to that and um this log situation i mean it's it's uh i mean it's almost i don't, I don't want to ruin it for anybody but it's it's almost like a magic trick like the way this works i mean when you're actually doing that stuff and you're tired and we've been yelling at you all day maybe you're a little bit wet and cold or whatever it's it feels a lot harder than it actually mm -hmm. is and primarily because you don't know what's coming next you don't know if this is going to go on for another two hours you don't know if we're going to wrap this up in 10 minutes sometimes you don't know if you're doing a good job or a bad job um depending on how guys are doing we'll jerk their chain a little bit and tell them how bad they suck and i can't what what is it with you come on and and they're doing great they're doing a great job but the whole thing is it is actually very carefully choreographed and carefully scripted. So you'll see us kind of gaggled up, you know, at the beginning. And we're kind of reviewing what we've already briefed. That like, all right, I'm going to be this observer. You're going to be doing this. You're going to be down there with those guys. And then when we switch, I'm going to go like this. So, I mean, it's almost like a play, you know, like I'm going this way. I'm the rock. You're the bottle cap. Go like this. And, uh, like a lot of what I'm doing is standing back. Just I'm like, I'm like your dad with a beer watching the car engine run, you know, after I just changed <laughs> something out, just, just listening for something that doesn't sound right. So I'm just kind of watching the whole thing go here and everything should be moving as one. All the sounds should sound just so I know when people should start to get miserable, when somebody <laughs> starts to get a little bit, like a little bit shaky, like, okay, it's time to wrap it up. All those things are carefully monitored. Mm -hmm. So if I don't remember a guy, then that's that's good job. I didn't <laughs> right. <notice you. laughs> hey, yeah, I do remember you. You ruined the whole day. You Thanks. ruined the whole thing. Oh, I remember you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guy. Yeah. Um, Bill, this was really great. Yeah, um, thanks, really Bill. cool insight. Um, great conversation. I know Logan and I talk, you know, really enjoy talking about like leadership and team building and all these things in general. We've spent hours on the phone talking about this stuff, like off the podcast. We try to bring it to the show whenever we can. And no better way to do it than with the guy who just did it with the commanders uh, earlier in the spring. Uh, if you want more about what APG does, I certainly assume that there are probably some folks who listen to our podcast that are in like the DC consulting, whatever spaces that run these big companies. I'm just, I now I'm pumping up our audience. Yeah. You out there <laughs> guy or gal with a big job. Who's also a commander's fan. If you want to learn more about bill and APG, you can go to APG.team uh, and maybe they can come bring their logs to your, uh, your, your space. Uh, bill, this was great. Thanks again. We really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we'll talk again down the line. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Good talking to you guys. Thanks for watching this clip of take command, which has a brand new home. That's right. You can watch on YouTube at the Team 980. You can also listen to full episodes in the free Odyssey app, which is now enabled with Apple CarPlay. So we'll just, you know, follow you around. <laughs>